Good evening. We will now call the County Council meeting for August 28, 2017 to order. First, I would like to say to each and every one of you, thank you for coming this evening. And also would like to let you know Chairman Smith will not be with us due to a very important um, work meeting that he had that was already standing, so he will not be with us. He may try to join us later via phone. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is approval of the agenda for August 28th. So move, Madam. Motion. So move, Madam Chair. Second. It has been moved and properly second. You'll hear discussion. Motion now moves six to zero. Next item on the agenda is invocation by Council Member Robinson. Let us bow our heads. Heavenly Father, a few of your citizens of Fairfield County to come together in the council chambers to say thank you. Thank you for allowing us to make this meeting. Thank you for allowing us for on another day's journey. We ask you that you bless the decisions we make and the decisions we haven't made yet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Next item on the agenda is approval of minutes for regular meeting on August 14, 2017. Do I hear a motion? So moved, Madam Chair. Second. It is moved and properly seconded. In a discussion, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? I hear none. The motion is so moved, six to zero. Next item on the agenda is public hearing. We have none. Next item on the agenda is first public comment session. Clerk to Council, Ms. Walker, please. We have two individuals to speak tonight. First, Mr. Jeff Schaefer on building codes. Good evening. Good evening. Council members, administrators, citizens. My name is Jeff Schaefer. I reside out of Lake Monticello. And uh, I live in District 4 under the good and wise hands of Councilwoman Mrs. Goins. Um, I haven't been around for a while. Some of you may have missed me. Some of you know missed me. Um, I see that you're going to adopt the 2009 edition of South Carolina Energy Conservation Code 2014 NCE code and the 2015 edition of the International Business Code. I went online. All of these are available in 2017 editions. So when this subject gets up, I'd like you to explain to me why we're taking what I would think is outdated codes. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, and not getting, and not buying. I presume there's a payment to be made uh, for the 2017. But I'll wait to hear what, what what's discussed. Um, there are a lot of things that need to be discussed in the public, and I'm happy to hear that the CEO is speaking tonight because I'm interested to hear what's happening with the new entity and the hospital. Um, and I cannot wait to hear the fire marshal's good news. I do hope that he'll be telling us somehow that we've managed to get fire hydrants out in my district. It would be nice to get a little break on our homeowner's insurance. Um, I get a chance to come back up here at the second call, but uh, before I sit down, I just want to simply say that every problem has a, has a solution. Um, and sometimes experience and good instincts find the great solution that ends that problem. And then on the other hand, some problems seem to go on like a leaky faucet until the time comes when you say, you know, maybe it's time we better off replacing the sink and the faucet and do the surgery. As painful as that is, sometimes there's some things we have to do they're a little painful for everybody, and maybe that decision obviously is up to you, but I'd like to hear those difficult decisions be expressed. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Randy Bright speaking on Ordinance 687. Randy Bright, District 1, Ridgeway. Focusing on 687, first I uh, have a request for a confirmation. If I recall from previous discussions on this, the reason behind it is so that we can share in a greater pot of revenue for this e expansion. Um, if there's anything else and if that is accurate, uh, I would appreciate a, uh, an answer at council time or at some time or as you discuss this. Uh, is, is that the reason? And are there any other reasons? Um, the other issue that I had with this ordinance is the last few words that say, and any other related matters. Now, that's a little open-ended 
for an ordinance. Uh, uh, you know, I'm sure the sheriff would like to enforce ordinances that say, in any other related matters. So I'm sure there's more specifics there, and I wonder if you could share any as you discuss this particular piece. And, you know, if I was voting on something, I, I'm not, I wouldn't vote unless I knew what other related matters meant. I'm sure it's innocuous, but let's be sure. Um, that's all I have. No other matters, related or not. Thank you. That concludes segment one. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is um, public hearing. We open this hearing at 6.05. At this time, it is on applications and expenditures for 2017 JAG Justice Assistant Grant Funds. At this time, before we hear any speakers, I would like uh, to ask our administrator if you would give an explanation, please. I'd be glad to. Uh, this is a, a grant that we apply for, I think, every year. Our sheriff is here, Sheriff Montgomery, and uh, I'll let him go over the specific details of the amount of money that we're going to be getting under the grant and what he intends to spend that money on. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, the grant that we're asking for is 10000 The amount is $10,591, and it will be for... Um, four AEDs uh, and 55 ear mics for Motorola. Um, the mics would help us with, uh, if we're dealing with a suspect and dispatch comes back to us and says that the suspect's got warrants on them, if we got the ear mics in, the suspect won't be able to hear that. Uh, they can hear it now if we're out talking to them, and which uh, is a safety issue for the officers. Uh, the AEDs will be uh, one per shift. They would swap them out. Um, supervisor will carry the AEDs, and that, that will be able to help in, uh, with uh, medical issues and um, until the EMS gets there. All right, any questions? How many earpieces? 55 total. That'll be for the entire Sheriff's Department, Sheriff? Yep. AED, that's a defibrillator. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, defibrillator. Anyone else? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Lockter, is anyone speaking in this? No one signed to speak. Okay, we close the hearing at 6 7. Thank you. Next item on the um, agenda is ordinance resolutions and orders. Ms. Lockter, please. Ordinance number 684, an ordinance adopting the 2015 edition of the International Building, Residential, Plumbing, Mechanical, Fuel, Gas, and Fire Codes as the mandatory building codes for Fairfield County, South Carolina. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. It has been moved and properly seconded. Is there any discussion? I would just like to ask. I, I talked to uh, Jason today a little bit about this and, and about all of these. I don't know when the appropriate time to give a little brief explanation. Is this would this be a proper time for you to give a, on I each mean, one at a time, or do we have to do them? I mean, I would be glad to. We you. have Tim, who could probably again give a better explanation. Tim Roseboro, our building uh, official, here to uh, talk about it also. But essentially what we're doing with these is we're we have been operating under these, but we have to bring ourselves in line as far as our our code can't hear me oh sorry we have to bring ourselves in line as far as the code that we're uh, actually operating under we've been doing it but we haven't adopted it we're kind of behind uh, in adopting these as we should i just wanted to make that clear that this is the code we've been on, been under for how long tim how since july, since july. if Excuse me, if I may, since we have not did any motion on it, if I may ask Mr. Roseboro before we move further, since there has been an explanation required, if you could give us some more information, please. Okay. <clears throat> Good evening, Good Council. Good evening. Um, the, the building codes are... Uh, adopted every every three years um, by the state. Um, we just haven't been um, um, adopting it through ordinance. 
we've we've always kept up with you know the codes, the electrical code, the building code, plumbing code, mechanical code. Uh, right now, our ordinance, we've um, we've adopted the 2000, 2003 um, mechanical code, um, um, plumbing code. Um, we've adopted the two thousand. Um, 2009 electrical code. Um, we, we're just trying to get caught up. We've 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 we've, we've always, um, um, whenever the state adopted codes for the state, we went by those codes. We just hadn't um, um, adopted it by ordinance. And right now we're we're just trying to get caught up with the just the ordinance um, portion of it. So nothing has actually changed as far as the codes itself themselves. No ma'am. Okay. No ma'am. Why wouldn't the ordinance read that we'd just be in line with the state all the time and when they changed it, we could just automatically change with them when they got a new um, addition? Yes, sir. That's that is an option. Well that should that should be what we're voting on. And I will say that's what many jurisdictions do. It just always we're in line with whatever the state has currently in place. Ours just for some reason does not. It states a specific year. Miss mm. Taylor, so there is not a twenty seventeen code yet, it's not up to date. Yes, yes, right. it, it is. But the state hadn't adopted it yet. And we don't know if the state will adopt it. So we have no idea as to when they will We don't have no idea. But if it read, if, if you had it in our reading in order that we would change with the state when they changed, unless it was something we didn't want, we could automatically change and go with the state. And then if we didn't like it, we could bring it up at a meeting and say why we didn't do it. Yes, sir. Anyone else? Yeah, if, if I may, um, I suggest that we may be looking to uh, possibly may table this until we find out when the state will adopt the new change until the next meeting pending approval. Is anyone else? But these are all three of these are not on the same timetable. Is that right? No, sir. They're, they're not. Um, the I'm electrical code, um, it, it, you discuss that now you're going to wait. Oh. That's what, just a moment. We can wait. Oh, yes, sir. Go ahead. I said the electrical code is every every two years, and all the other codes are every three years. So that's why it's a little different, you know. With um, all right, on the electrical code, um, Mr. Schaefer okay. said that it's already an yeah, addition out in 2017. Yes, sir. If our if our reading read that we would go along with the state on what they said that the code would be. We wouldn't have to worry about tabling anything on coming back. We just change these to read that we would go along with the state and not have to worry about it. Yes, sir. My, uh, I don't know about. Now my suggestion would be let's let's go ahead and uh, and approve these for the time being now, and since we're we're already enforcing these ordinances. And then we can, um, and then we can amend the ordinances to be approved by state statute for all of them in the future. I, I think that would make sense, yes, sir. And I agree to that because we're, uh, as he said, we're coming up to um, the level where we are supposed to actually be. Once we are there, then we can make necessary amendments or changes. Once we're at that point, okay. All right. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Okay. I have a motion for item 684. All in favor? We got a second. You got a motion. Oh, okay. Excuse me. Okay. Right. Discussion. All, all in favor of um, accepting this ordinance 684 as it stands? Uh -huh. Opposed? Motion moves 6 to 0. Ms. Lockler. Ordinance number 685, an ordinance adopting the 2014 edition of the National Electric Code, NEC, as the mandatory electrical code for Fairfield County, South Carolina. May I have a motion, please? So moved, Madam Chair. Second. 
discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? I hear none. Motion so moved, 6 to 0. Ms. Lockers. Ordinance number 686, an ordinance adopting the 2009 edition of the South Carolina Energy Conservation Code, regulating and governing energy efficient building envelopes and installation of energy efficient mechanical lighting and power systems in Fairfield County, South Carolina providing for the issuance of permits and collection of fees, therefore. I hear a motion. So moved, Madam Chair. Second. It's been moved and properly. Second. Discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? I hear none. Motion moves, six to zero. Next item on the agenda, Ms. Lockler. First reading by title only, ordinance number 687. An ordinance authorizing an amendment to the master agreement governing the I-77 corridor regional industrial park by and between Richland County, South Carolina and Fairfield County, South Carolina to expand the boundaries of the park to include certain real property located in Richland County, 209 Stone Ridge, LLC and other related matters. Black your motion. So moved, Madam Chair. Second. It has been moved and properly second. Is there any discussion? Um, I would like to make a remark on that particular item. It is extremely necessary. I know it has been a concern for a long time, but for the movement of our county, the betterment of our county, this is a definite um, action we need to take, and especially in lieu of what has happened with us. The um, possibilities are still there. As I went to the uh, meeting at the government, at the complex on I-77, and I was riding back, I saw the... Um, properties on I-77, but I also saw veins that lead back into our county. If we can get the right industries, the right businesses there, we can grow Fairfield County. We're in competition, and they're not going to come to us. They're not going to beg us. We're in competition with every other county around us, and it's going to cost us. It's going to um, be hard work to get the right business in for us, but this is something we have to do if we're going to survive. All right, thank you. Okay, anyone else? Carolyn, um, could Mr. Taylor tell us about the other related matter? I'm sure that is just a catch-all. It's a very broad catch-all. I can go back and find out information on that, but I do not know what they're referring to as far as other related matters at this point, but I can find that we're information. We're voting on it, and we don't know what we're voting on the other related now, matters. It, it, this is an ex expansion of a, of a situation related to a multi-county park. And I'm sure that's just a, well, a general well. phrase. Madam Chair, this, and this is just uh, first reading, so if you, we could find out before the next one what that is, good. Yeah, Thank you. Good. Anyone else? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? I hear none. Motion carries 6 to 0. Next item on the agenda, board and commission minutes. And then... All, may I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. It has been moved and properly second. Is there any discussion? All in favor, signify, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? I hear none. Motion carries six to zero. Next item on the agenda is boards and commissions appointment. This particular item, we're going to... Um, table until we receive further information on it. Next item on the agenda is old business. We have none. New business consideration of approval of application for the 2017 JAG Justice Assistant Grant Funds. May I hear a motion? So moved, Madam Chair. Second. It has been moved and properly second. Is there any discussion? All in favor signify, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? I hear none. Motion carries six to zero. Next item on the agenda is county administrator's report. Mr. Taylor. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, tonight we have uh, Tony Hill, our fire marshal, who will be giving us a presentation, as, as council is aware and the audience. <coughs> uh, at each council meeting, we are trying to have one of our department heads come and give a report on their department. Mr. Tony Hill. Good evening, Council. Good evening. Members of the public. I got a new pair of glasses. I 
I gotta get just focused right. I can't see nothing yet. <laughs> okay. The fire service, uh, you know, our main call is, I mean, responsibility to respond to emergencies for the citizen of the county, whether it be wood, brush, cars, whatever. But other things, uh, years ago, well, not years ago, I'd say about five years ago at the latest, EMS approached us after we've had two or three deaths throughout the state that EMS person getting hit by vehicles on roadway accidents and stuff. And Mike Tanner came to us and asked if the fire service would respond to all 1050s to, we didn't used to go to all of them, but we go to pretty much all of them now, to mainly to protect the EMS. We block roads for the EMS won't have to be looking over their shoulder when they're working on a patient in a car. We direct traffic and we just kind of protect them, but then we also there for fuel spills and other stuff like that too, but mainly that, that's something new we've been doing in the last five years is protecting EMS on the roadways during accidents so they're going to get their job done a lot quicker. Okay, we provide, we have 166 members, volunteers right now. And this will reflect the recruiting intention, but 15 years ago we had 250 members. So we're down right out of 100 members. A little over 100, about right 100. And that's just, you know, that's nationwide. Uh, recruitment program, we're starting a new recruitment program with, uh, there's our recruitment reader right there. Uh, Ray Hoshel has just stepped up to take on the recruitment of the volunteers through the county through the Chiefs Association. And we're We've had about three meetings and we're coming up with some ideas on how to get the word out that we need volunteers other than the word of mouth. And uh, we, we'll probably have a meeting. I think we've got a meeting next week. No, second week in February, I mean uh, September. But also we provide training through, it's either through the South Carolina Fire Academy. Also we have our in-house instructors that we do a lot of training in this county. So far this year, we've had 1152, which is a basic firefighting course. We've had hazmat training. Through, all this is through the academy. Uh, we've had CPR first aid. We've had an EVDT, that's emergency vehicle driver's training, just wrapped up two weeks ago. And Thursday, we're starting 1153, which is firefighter one. You take 52 first, and then those other classes I said, and then you go into uh, 53. That's just uh, what we've done so far this year. And there's more training. Greg has a train. We have some type of training going on every month, usually except for December, in this county to train the firemen on all kind of stuff. We have a smoke detector program in the county where we. We've always put smoke detectors up. I've had a smoke detector pro program going on in this county for the last 15 years with the assistance of Fairfield Electric Co-op giving me grants to buy smoke detectors. I probably put, we, the fire service has probably put in close to a thousand smoke detectors over the last 10 years. But we've partnered up with uh, South Carolina State Fire now, which is the the old name was the South Carolina Fire Marshal's Office. It's called the South Carolina State Fire now. They have a smoke detector program now that we're involved with. They furnish the smoke detectors. We go out and provide. We, we install them. We just don't hand smoke detectors to people. We go out and install them. We give them a little fire prevention safety stuff while we're there and things like that. So we're trying to get, you know, smoke detectors, whoever needs them, you just call my office and let us know, and we'll try to, we'll do our best and quick as we can to get a smoke detector in your home. One, two, three, however, how many it takes. The, the state is providing smoke detectors to us on that program. We also do a little, we do fire prevention through the local schools. Well, fire prevention week's coming up. It's the first full week in uh, October. We usually go mainly to the grammar schools and we have a fire prevention program for them. I've, this is my 20th year partnering with the National Fire Safety Council. 
they they go through the county and collect. I mean, they they get funding through businesses and other SCNG. I mean, uh, I don't know if any of y'all have ever participated in it. They provide fire prevention material for every child from K-1 to the fourth grade in this county. They'll be sending it to me about probably about the middle of September. And then I take it to the schools the first week in October to be given out during fire prevention week. And the teachers, the little lesson plan comes with it. They give gives it to the teachers to give to every student in this county from K-1 to 5, fourth grade. I've been doing that for 20 years. <clears throat> we provide a uh, fire extinguisher training for anybody. Uh, I've had it here for the public works. I've, I've been to Uniroyal, which performance fiber, I always ca still call it Uniroyal. We go to Isola. We, if any industry has a little fire brigade that they need fire training, we go and do a fire extinguisher, a, a hands-on live burn at their facility for whoever they're, they do it. Uh, we do it for Camp Levita every spring. They bring in college students for their counselors for, for that. We teach them every year. We've been doing that for since 1982. And, and getting back to our recruitment attention, I talked about it a little bit. I can say we are aggressively going after recruitment and attention now. We've we've been doing things in the past. It's just we're not get, We feel we're not getting enough volunteers. We need volunteers in this county, whether it's, you know, we, we'll take you in at 16, our junior program, 16, 17 year olds, and then when you turn 18, you know, you, you, start, you can get your firefighter one training at the age of 16 now. It's just you can't go into a burning building until you turn 18, but at least you're already trained. So, I mean, that's a a, a good program. We work with the CTT program over here with, with Tony Fierro at the school. This is his third year over there that we've had the program. We work closer with the him. We go over there so many times a year. Greg and myself will go over there and assist him with things. They use our training center. He'll bust the uh, children up to the training center and do their whatever hands-on training they need to do there. Okay. Like I said, we had a, I kind of get ahead of myself. Like I said, we got only 166 people. We're down big time. We probably, we, we need 100 more volunteers in this county. And How are you um, trying to get volunteers? Are you still doing word of mouth or just? <coughs> Sir? How are you doing your advertising for your um, firemen now? We've been going to this word of mouth, and we we go to all these county uh, festivals. We do the the Blair Festival. We do Rock Around the Clock. We do Pig on the Ridge, and the festivals. That's mainly what we've been doing. But we're trying to get advertisement now. We're looking going to advertisement billboards, mail outs. Uh, I just got some stuff from a company on mail outs, and we go we're going that route right now to get the word out there to everybody that we need volunteers. Uh, one other thing we've been looking at is uh, the, the to-go bags at restaurants is print our message on the to-go bag and furnish that bag to that restaurant and every go, everything that goes out that restaurant will have our message on it. That's another thing we're looking at doing. I mean, I mean that's... You helped me... Um with uh, an engineer needing to know longitude and latitude of uh, 500, uh, the public might want to know how they could go about getting the longitude and latitude also of the 500s in Fairfield County. Well, I went around and GPSed every one of those fire hydrants over the last couple of years. I got a map from the water company. I went out and actually set the GPS on top of every fire hydrant in this county. And the, the map I sent you 
was it's a Google Earth overlay that you know actually shows where they're at on every road, just where they're at. So that's a uh, where we have put them, and uh, and I've given that to uh, our GIS up in tax assessor's office, and he is he's put them on a county map for me for for our use. And we also we do fire investigations. When a fire department goes to a fire, whether it's you know, a car fire or woods, any fire that is suspicious, we'll even me or Greg or one of we got three investigators that will go look and see if we can see the cause. If it seems suspicious, we'll call in the sheriff's department and or SLED because uh, we don't have the power to arrest anyone or anything, so we have to call in law enforcement to assist us in the uh, in the investigation on stuff like that, on arson or suspicious fire to see if they were if it was arson. We also we have an automatic aid agreement with the town of Winsboro. The town of Winsboro comes assist us on any structure fire within three miles of the city limits. And then in turn, it's three miles outside the city. And uh, we in turn, we automatically come into the city limits on all structure fires. So we work well with the town of Winsboro Fire Service. And uh, that, that helps us out a big time, especially two in the morning that we have to get up get dressed and then go to the fire if it's on right out here on the uh, mill village they have somebody sitting right there they can have a truck there a lot quicker than we can within that three mile radius outside the city limits it's late at night it helps us big time and then we help them with manpower and stuff inside the town of course i have a two part-time workers that they go out this came about about six years ago, six, seven years ago. We were going to fires that some of the equipment didn't work when they got there. Chainsaw wouldn't crank, the smoke ejector wouldn't crank, and just SCBAs wasn't being properly maintained. But we was relying on the volunteer to do that. And over a period of time, I saw they wasn't doing it, so I approached the administration and, and I got some people. They go out and check every truck in this county, crank up all the equipment that's gasoline, make sure it's running. Everything is fire ready when a volunteer jumps in that truck at three in the morning. They know that equipment's going to work. We didn't know that it would have worked six, seven years ago because the volunteers wasn't keeping it up like they should. So I'm glad the administration allow me to get a couple of people to do that we got 52 trucks out there to maintain and lord knows the equipment that's on them that we have to keep up who and does the pms on it who does the preventive maintenance on it the the change the oils and filter and do brake jobs and stuff like that the, our county maintenance I mean, other than the maintenance i'm saying who checks the equipment so forth and so on and how uh, how is it done I have two part-time people to go around and do that on a daily basis. It's done monthly or weekly? Weekly. I mean, they, they, they do other stuff too, but uh, their main responsibility is to make sure everything on that truck is in working condition at all times. Um, I want to ask you, on the fire hydrants, is there a certain amount that are supposed to be in each area or are they supposed to be a certain distance apart and just how is, how is that well the fire hydrants is is not the county's responsibility it's the water district's responsibility because they own the, the county doesn't own a water system years ago the county had a program this is how we got all the fire hydrants out lake watery Mitford County, Mitford Water District was going to extend the water line all down all the roads at Lake Waterbury. But they were just going to run a four inch line. <clears throat> that won't support a fire hydrant. So the county 
had a program that they would additionally they'd give so much for a fire hydrant and so much to upgrade the pipe to a six inch line a minimum of six inch for we could put fire hydrants on them out in the rural areas so i mean that program has kind of gone to the wayside now i don't i don't think the county has it no more the county was putting like a hundred thousand dollars a year into that program i mean some year they might only spend ten fifteen thousand but I'm quite sure at Lake Waterloo they probably spent the whole hundred thousand because we wouldn't have an ISO rating of five or six out there now. Those people would still be a class nine, and because of the fire hydrants out there now, I think we put in 80, 82 or eighty-three fire hydrants on Lake Waterloo under that program that the county the county actually paid for that to upgrade the system to get fire hydrants and. It, it went for anywhere. If Ridgeway wanted to extend a water line, Mid County Water, Jenkinsville, they put in a request saying, "We're going to run this. We're going to run a four-inch line. Will y'all help us upgrade it to a six-inch line and put fire hydrants on it?" And that's the only way you go get fire hydrants in this county because these these water companies aren't. They provide potable water only. They don't in the business of providing fire water. So. We kind of got to work with the water companies to upgrade their system when they run in a, if they run a mile water line and don't put no fire hydrants on it, that's hurting the homeowners as far as getting the ISO rating lowered because water is 40% of the ISO equation. So, I mean, that might be a, a program y'all want, might want to look back into is and uh, I can get with the administrator and, and Davis can tell us how, we can tell him how that thing worked back then. Is talking about new water lines. Yes, new water lines. We didn't go in and put in fire hydrants on existing water lines. It was all new water lines. If they was going to run a four inch potable water line three miles, you can't put fire hydrants on four inch water line. Six inches to bare minimum. So, uh, it would help the the county would help foot the bill to upgrade the pipe and pay for the fire hydrants buy the fire hydrants and put and and they would put them in as they was going so i mean that was a good program we got a lot of fire hydrants put in this county under that program and i think that program needed to come back especially if you're looking at infrastructure and stuff in the future all right thank you and uh And talking about fire hydrants, I've, I just received my stuff in. I ordered, I'm marking all the fire hydrants in the county, especially the ones that's out in the real rural areas. I'm gonna try to keep, get my crew to keep the bushes cut around them because we can't see them at nighttime. I ordered it's a 50 inch thing. It's got three different colors on it that reflect at nighttime that we'll be able to see a fire hydrant. Because I thought about, well, about two years ago, we had a fire. There was a fire hydrant within 300 feet of the house. We couldn't see it because it was grown over with weeds. They were shoveling water five mile round trip with a fire hydrant 300 feet down the road. Didn't even use it because they didn't know it was there. So I'm marking them. If the weeds do grow up around them, that reflective thing will be sticking. Well, we have active 911. We have that on our active 911. If you hit the location and blow the map up, Greg has put all the fire hydrants that you, that I sent you is on our active 911. You'll be able to see them on your telephone where where all fire hydrants are. So the active 911 does on a lot more than just notifying us of the fire. So we can do that right there. Any other questions? Okay. And the, the last thing I got is the western side of the county. ISO will be here Wednesday to evaluate the western side of the county to see if, what we can get to lower that down from there. Everybody's out there class nine now. 
So since we've got the, I was gonna do this last year, but in the process of building the new station and things like that, I held off on it. So uh, everything's in place now. He, the ISO will be here Wednesday about 11 o'clock. He'll probably be here Wednesday and Thursday. And we're going to, he's going to evaluate everything for those, for those new stations. I'm combining all three of them stations into one department. This could be called Western, we call Western, I mean Fairfield Western Fire District as far as ISO is concerned, because each one of those stations individually cannot lower their rating. I have to combine them for I can use all the manpower, all the equipment and everything up under one, one name, and then we'll see what we get. Um, Hoping for a six, but I more likely end up with a seven. But you never know. The ISO changed their rules and regulations in 2013. Some good things, some bad things. So, uh, but ISO is coming in Wednesday. And uh, it, once he evaluates everything, it usually takes two to three months, maybe four months before they, they'll send They'll send Mr. Taylor a letter and me a letter telling us what we got, what what rating we have. And then it usually goes into effect. If we can get our recognition, I mean, whatever we're going by the end of the year, hopefully in January, the, the new rating will take effect with the insurance companies. So uh, that's mainly what we're doing right now. And the new radio system that y'all purchased he is working great. Wonderful. That's wonderful. <laughs> okay, I also want to thank you so very much for all that you all do and want to ask, um, and so we've asked before, is there anything that we can do to help with your promotion and uh, volunteer program? Is there anything we can do, the team can do to help with that? Or the community, is there anything Besides what you all, you have some good ideas in place. So is there anything we can do to help promote it? Well, like I say, once we, we break, we, we've got a list of ideas, we want to prioritize them and see what we're going to do. I didn't budget anything for all this this year, so we will see what's, what's going to cost, and then I'm going to go to come to Mr. Then Taylor you let and us say, know. Okay. <laughs> okay. We don't have the money in the budget for this. Will you help us out? <laughs> so... Uh, I don't think we, we we're not talking a lot, whole lot of money. We we only talking about maybe spending it's six, right. eight thousand, ten thousand at the most to do what we want, what we really need to start off doing. All right, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Next, we have Ms. Jennifer Stevens uh, here to give council a quarterly 4-H report. Good evening. Good evening. And thank you so much for having us this afternoon, this evening, and allowing us to come before you. Um, my name is Jennifer Stevens, and I am your 4-H agent for Fairfield County. I have provided the council with um, an update, a review, actually, of 4-H activities over the past three months. So we won't go into detail on that because this evening we really wanted to highlight something that we are just so, so proud of. We had six students that were selected from Fairfield Central High School to attend the Pickney Leadership Conference on Clemson University. This conference was created um, in memory of Senator Pickney who was not only a leader in the community, but also an advocate of 4-H and a former 4-H'er. So we were so very proud to have six students that were selected because of the wonderful essays that they wrote and because of their resumes. These students were selected to come to this awesome opportunity in honor of Senator Pickney. So this evening, we really just wanted to share um, some of those experiences. And I want to also give a heartfelt thanks 
to some of the council members who took the opportunity to donate registrations for our students and allowed them to go. We cannot, cannot thank you enough for the experience. And when you hear from these students and the one letter that I have to read to you, you'll know exactly why. So the names of those students, Antoine Young, Jeffrey Feaster, Dayon Woodard, Alexis Williams, Gerald Lawhorn, and Harrison Kennedy. All of the students couldn't be here tonight because of some prior commitments and, and other things that they had. Um, we do have two students with you with us. They'll be speaking to you just briefly. And um, we have one student who wanted to write a letter to you. And if I may, I'd like to read that letter at this time. I would like to thank the council for providing the opportunity for us to go to the Pickney Leadership Conference at Clemson University. It was a great honor to be selected. We represented Fairfield well. It was a great experience to meet new people and to get to work with others. I had fun learning how to be an effective leader, mostly how to interact with others. I was greatly honored that I received an award for best attitude. I definitely was not expecting that. I am just the type of guy who likes to stay humble and get along with everyone. Again, thanks for your support. It means a lot to us. As a senior in high school, I appreciate opportunities like these. I pray that these skills I learned will be skills that I take with me for the rest of my life. Sincerely, Dayon Woodard. Good evening, council members. My name is Antoine Young, and I'm currently a junior at Fairfield Central High School. I was honored and very happy to be a part of the program. And I want to thank you guys for giving us the opportunity to, to be able to go. I want to also thank Ms. Feaster, Ms. Jennifer, and also Ms. Pam for allowing me to be a part of it. It was a great experience for me and my fellow colleagues. Colleagues, we really enjoyed the program and we learned how to become more of a leader in our community, church, school, home. And I really just overall enjoyed the program and made a lot of different friends from different places. And it was a great experience for me to meet Miss Pickney and her two kids. And I thank you guys for allowing me to come and speak about it. Hello everyone, my name is Jeffrey Feaster and I'm the Science Ambassador of 4-H and I just want to say that thank you so much for letting us participate in the Pickney Leadership Conference because it, it not only improved my leadership but it improved my personality. Um, I met a lot of people from different states, Florida, Virginia, and they were cool, nice. <laughs> and also I just want to say uh, Mr. Pickney he was an inspirational leader even though he's not here with us today he still is in with our spirits so I just want to say thank you as you can see this was a wonderful opportunity for our students and it doesn't end there, it doesn't end here. One of the requirements that I asked of them was that they come back to the community and show um, the results of their labor. So I hope that you will see them throughout the community. I hope that you'll see green everywhere you look. 4-H um, is on the move and we want to continue to offer every child in Fairfield County the opportunity to be a 4-H'er. Remember 4-H makes the best better. Thank you so much, and I want to say thank you to each and every one of our students. You are a part of us, therefore our future depends on what you do. So we thank you so very much and wish you all the best in life. And thank you so much for your leadership and for your compassion toward our young people. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Madam. Madam Chair, yes. yeah, Ms. Stevens, I wanted to thank you too for, for what you do. It's, a, it's an encouragement to a lot of young kids. Thank, thank these two young men for coming, and we're just proud of them. And yes. hey, we couldn't see the other ones, but we're proud of all of them and what y'all do. Thank yes. you so much. 
Next, we have Mr. Eric Robinson, the library director for Fairfield County. He's here not to give a full report on the library system, but to update council on the situation with the Ridgeway branch and uh, what his plans are to continue to provide services in Ridgeway. Okay. I noticed on the agenda it said that I was going to talk a little bit about Ridgeway, but I, in doing some homework and asking Ms. McMaster when was the last time she came and gave a report on the library, she said it was around 2005, 2006. So, so with it being a, 11 or 12 years, I figured I'd take this moment to give you a little bit of background on what we do at the library, um, and then we'll talk some about Ridgeway. Um, my staff put together some goodie bags for you. I saw um, Mr. Robinson at the library before I left, and I jokingly said, these are for those who do not ask questions. Um, <laughs> But everybody's welcome to a goodie bag. They're just some fun things we had left over from our summer reading program. Um, the first thing I'd like to talk to you about are a little bit of the statistics that we have going on at the library. Um, we were fortunate enough for you all to pass a budget for us this coming year of $524,735. Um, you have this information in front of you if you want to refer to it. Um, when you break that down, that's about $21.90 per capita. So how does this relate to what we do in the library? And I've given you several scenarios here, and if you would bear with me for a moment, and I'll try to make this as brief as I can. Um, I'll read through some of these scenarios so you can get an idea of what we do at the library. Um, scenario number one, patron number one comes in several times a week and reads the Wall Street Journal, looks at the value line stock reports, and checks out back issues of Business Week, Fortune, and Newsweek magazine. For his $21.90, he gets a Wall Street Journal subscription that would cost him $588. The Value Line Investment Survey would cost him $598. The Business Week subscription runs about $75. Fortune Magazine subscription is $19.99. And the Newsweek Magazine subscription is $149.99. So we've saved this person over time about $1,400.30 or excuse me, $1,430.98. Scenario number two, uh, this patron comes in two times a week and uses an internet, internet workstation. This is what he or she gets for $21.90. One month of internet access, we guessed around $50, give or take, depending on who you get your internet through. The use of the computer, if they were to buy a computer, is a minimum of $500. So we've saved this patron $550 over the course of a year. Scenario number three is a homeschooling mom who checks out 25 books to supplement the unit she's teaching. Here's what she gets for her $21.90. The average cost of children's books run around $18. You multiply that by $25, and we're saving her $450 a month. You multiply that by 12 months, and we're saving her $5,400 per year just to help supplement her teaching of her children. Patron number five or a family of four who visit the library. The dad gets some automotive repair books and the mom gets cookbooks and some mysteries. The kids play a game on the computer and check out Harry Potter and Junie B. Jones books. The family also checks out four DVDs. Here's what they get for the $109.50. Four adult nonfiction books at $30 each cost them $120. Two adult fiction books at $25 each cost them 50 bucks. Two children's books at $18 each are $36, and four DVDs at $21 would cost them $84. That's a savings of $290, not counting the computer time. So, this may sound like a lot of money to you, but we're very fortunate that we have this kind of money that we can spend on our patrons. And the more money we have, the more we can offer for them that help with savings for them at home. Okay, um, if you're following along on page three, the statistics that are here are statistics from last year. I just briefly want to run through these for you. Um, the total number of patron visits we had last year in the library were 80,443 people that walked through the door. Total items available in our collection are 83,746. Total items that circulated last year are 51,556 items. Ebooks and audio books that circulated were 2,903. The total number of registered patrons we have are 7,849. Total public service hours that we offer at the library last year were 3,836 hours. Computer login sessions, 20,258 people logged into the computers at the Fairfield County Library. And wireless login sessions, 
registered 3,164. We're also a member of the SC Lens Consortium. It's a 21 library consortium in which we share items within our library. Um, last year, we lent out 6,279 items and we borrowed 2,482 items. So having or being a part of SC Lens allows us to spend monies elsewhere that we don't have to spend monies on the books not always because some of these books are available through our SC Lens Consortium libraries. So those monies can be spent on other things like computers and other uh, databases that we may need to, to help our ch children when it comes to study time and allowing them to have different things on the computers that would be of educational value to them. Um, we have 11 staff, eight are full-time, three are part-time. Um, Program-wise last year, we offered a total of 74 in-house programs with an attendance of 1,036 people attending those programs. Community programs, we had 58 of those, and total community attendance was 1,888 people attending those programs. Total programs equaled 132, with a total attendance of 2,924 people attending. Uh, new for 2017, uh, we've added some adult programming. We're offering computer courses, um, we are trying to get a quilting club. We're talking about possibly having a library book club, uh, different things along those lines. The computer classes were a, a huge hit for us, um, so much so that we offered 16 programs and we had 166 people show up for these programs. Um, and in a small amount of time, this new librarian came in in February and we already had the 16 programs in place by then or by now. So that was wonderful that we're offering something for our adults, not just our kids. Um, some of the children's programmings, programs that we offer, uh, we offer summer reading programs, Halloween parties, uh, our trunk or treat last year was one of the biggest programs we've ever had for children. We had a little over 200 people come to our trunk or treat. Um, we have Santa and a trim the tree party in December. Uh, there's the Fairfield County read-in that takes place in April in which we're trying to get all the Fairfield County schools to participate in. Currently, right now, it's just the public schools, but we're going to talk to the STEM school and Richard Wynn to try to get them involved this coming year. Um, we had about 250 top readers from all the schools that participated last year. Um, for adults, again, we're offering beginner and intermediate computer classes. We've offered um, a speaker to come in and talk about local history. Someone came in and did a, a speech on some essential oils and how they can be used in the home. So we're offering different variety of things for the adults that, that kind of fall in line with what they need and what they want. Okay, services that we offer at the library. Uh, we laugh and say that we're Winsburg's Kinko's. Uh, we offer photocopying, faxing, scanning, printing, um, and I, our friends group even sells stamps, envelopes, flash drives, folders, that kind of thing, because it's hard to find those in Winsboro now. Uh, job services, we help with resumes. Uh, we have computer services where we help with job applications and unemployment benefits. Um, we also have a library job center that we've put in place where um, we work with WIA and other places like that that send us job openings that we post throughout the library so that the patrons that come in know what's available and, and who's out there that can be of help to them. Um, one of the stories I laugh and tell, my very first day on the job, I had a gentleman call me over to a public computer and he said, can you help me with this? And I said, what are we doing? He said, I'm signing up for Ob Obamacare. And I said, sure, I'll be glad to help. And I looked at the computer screen and it was in Spanish. So not only had I not ever looked at the Obamacare and was, I was not familiar with the questions that we're going to ask, I said, all right, well, you got to translate before I can tell you what it's asking you to do. So that segues into our staff training. What I try to do is I try to have my staff as educated as they can on our technology that's in the library for any question that arises there, and also to be able to have just ideal customer service skills when people come in and ask. Sometimes we hit and miss with that, but most of the time we strive to do our best. Everybody's human. They're going to have moments where things just, either they don't understand what's being asked of them, excuse me, asked of them, or they're not really sure how to do what's being asked of them, but there's always somebody in the library that can answer the question for them, and for that we're very thankful. Um, I'd also like to praise, while I'm at it, um, the Fairfield County Sheriff's Department. We do two full-day trainings. 
One's in June and one's in December. And this past June, we did a full day training on an active shooter in the library. Um, coming from a school system, I think about those things. You know, what do we do if somebody comes in with a gun? Um, I don't know if you've been in the library, but it would be kind of like shooting fish in a barrel. But after um, talking to the sheriff's department, we have some things in, pl in place now in case that were to happen that's going to make our patrons feel safe and my staff feel safe. So to them, I'm very thankful that they'll do that. Um, on the list is trying to get or we'll get the um, fire marshal in to talk to us about what we can do in case of a fire, how to run fire drills and that kind of thing. Um, mainly, like I said, just to keep our patrons safe and the staff safe. Um, some of the changes that have come, come by um, in 11 years. Um, most of them have been cosmetic. If you've ridden by, you've noticed that the library now is named the Sarah D. McMaster Fairfield County Library. Um, not many people work 40 years in the same position, and when she retired, I just felt that that was very important to, that her name be on the building, and I thank you all for allowing that to happen. Um, that was a great honor for her. Uh, there, in 11 years, have been several staff retirements and new employees and new positions that have come along. Uh, most of those are in place so that we can go with the flow of what's coming along with libraries and most of that deals with technology and the last thing i want to talk about is the temporary closing of the ridgeway branch um, the building that we're currently in after having um, some inspectors come in there's some issues there that are going to end up being health issues and that is one of the reasons why we will no longer be located in that building. Um, I could go into detail about what these health issues are, but after talking to the inspector, he said it's just not safe. So again, I'm having to look out for my patrons and I'm having to look out for the staff that's in that building. So temporarily what we're gonna do is we're gonna service Ridgeway with the bookmobile. Um, patrons in Ridgeway can still place holds on their books. They will be delivered to them that one or two days a week through the bookmobile. Uh, the mayor has given us permission to sit in the cotton yard um, under one of the shade trees so that my um, uh, staff member, while he's in the bookmobile, won't be suffering in the heat of the, of the bookmobile. Um, and in the meantime, we're doing our best to try to find a more permanent location in Ridgeway. But property and locations in Ridgeway are kind of at a premium and um, it's not easy to make this transition seamless because there's just not that much that seems to be available. A lot of great ideas that are out there. Um, we're looking into as many of those as we can uh, and we hope to get the, the Ridgeway branch back in a permanent location as soon as we can, but I'm not sure that's going to happen in the next uh, three months. So the doors will shut uh, September 1st, then we will start serving, um, well, <laughs> we hope to start serving the week of September 1st, our bookmobile, because it kind of sat in dry dock for a little while, it is currently in the shop with some issues that are going on with it that we're trying to get solved because, you know, things happen when things sit and don't go out for a while. So we're in the process of getting those fixed as well. But as soon as those are up and running, hopefully in the next week, uh, we will be able to serve the patrons of Ridgeway through the bookmobile. Any questions? I, I promise I'll still give you your goodie bag. Yes, sir, you can. <laughs> and thank you so much for the presentation thank and letting us know the great work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to leave these with the card. She'll pass these out. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Next, we have Ms. Suzanne Dosher, the CEO of the Fairfield Memorial Hospital, here to give us an update on uh, what's going on at the hospital and okay. answer questions that council may have. Thank you, Jason, for inviting me. Good, night. Good evening. Good evening. Um, so when Jason asked me to give an update on the, the status of the hospital, I developed uh, my response based on your agenda, so hopefully I'll cover some of your questions. Uh, the hospital continues to provide emergency services, inpatient services, short-term rehab. We have a rural health clinic, rehabilitation services, laboratory, imaging, respiratory therapy services, and home health. All those continue to exist. Due to a recent financial and need evaluation and consultation with the medical staff and the board, we have discontinued nuclear medicine services and we've discontinued sleep studies. Um, also, early September, we'll discontinue the MRI services, and they just were not being utilized, and so, so they were costing more than they were actually um, benefiting the hospital or the community. 
So to touch on the financial report in July, um, the hospital ended with a net loss of 128000 for the month of July. And that was a net year-to-day loss of just over a million dollars. So that's our fiscal year starts October 1st, so that's a 10-month period. The hospital financials are reported on a, a recruitment basis. Uh, most people have a better understanding of cash basis. Like me, I know how to balance my checkbook a lot more than I understand the accrual accounting. Um, so we also report... EBITDA, which is a better profitability um, indicator uh, that more correlates with cash. And so the year-to-date EBITDA for the hospital was a negative 330000 um, It's better reflection of uh, how much we've had to go into our um, reserves. The total cash of the hospital right now is about a million dollars. That's before payroll at the end of the week. So that is our cash position right now. So when you compare the EBITDA from this year, a negative 330000 to last year, it was negative 570000 So the financial performance of the hospital is better this year, um, but it's, it's um, not going to keep up with the declines. And that's volume declines that we've been experiencing. Um, there's a lot of overhead with the hospital, so we don't feel like we can cut enough overhead to keep up with those declines. Um, we don't want to cut direct patient care because that's just continued revenue declines. Um, probably the biggest impact on our revenue declines is the declining admissions. Uh, last year to date, we had 97 admissions. This year to date, we had 76. So last year, we had approximately 10 admissions a month. Um, it doesn't sound like a big decrease from 97 to 76, but we actually in July only had two admissions. So that's um, that's a pretty significant financial decline. Um, so CMS, it's the, the Medicare Medicaid payer, um, they determine uh, how to pay hospitals. And they pay inpatient a lot higher than they pay for the emergency room services. And so the loss of those inpatients um, is, is a hard hit for the hospital. Uh, but when we look at the emergency room, uh, the emergency room has the volume has been declining over the last several years, but the the volumes have leveled off now. This year to date is very comparable to last year to date at about 6,500 emergency room visits. We think that um, we think that getting that to level off has a lot to do with the physicians that we brought in. We brought in the vendor MCare that provides the physicians. They're the same physicians that work in a lot of the other community hospitals. They just take shifts in our emergency room also. Um, that service has also brought in a satisfaction tool. And um, so in, in providing this tool to our patients, uh, they've, they have identified that the, the physician satisfaction, the nursing satisfaction, the overall satisfaction from our patients is over 95%. And so people who come into our emergency room are, are very pleased with their services. Um, those satisfaction scores, as well as our length of stay, are actually posted in the emergency room for, for our patients and for anybody to see. So um, that's retrospective, um, a little bit about going forward. So last year, the number one top priority, as determined by the hospital board and by the county council, was to make sure that we continue to have a 24-hour emergency room service in this community. Um, so in May... We were successful in getting the non-binding memorandum of understanding signed with the county board, hospital board, and with um, Providence. Um, that is a great step towards getting long-term care in this community. I mean, a lot of communities our size are, are losing their hospitals, are losing their emergency rooms. If you look at Bamberg, Barnwell, Marlboro, um, Williamsburg, hopefully that's temporary, but a lot of communities are losing any kind of 24-hour coverage in their in their um, their uh, communities. So there's a question about well, how can Providence do this, and we can't do this right now. But Providence has a lot of things that we don't have. First of all, it's going to be a much smaller, much newer building, so it's going to be a lot less expensive to keep up. Um, they have the efficiencies. You know, we have we have a 
somebody who specializes in every area, and they can tap into those efficiencies with the other hospitals. And then they have the strength, the purchasing strength of LifePoint. They can buy things a lot cheaper than we can buy them. And so they have, they have a lot of things that will help them to sustain that 24-hour emergency room. Um, so hopefully Jason and I can work together, and once we have the binding agreement that really tells the details, um, we can come back and talk about that a little more um, so, so the community can hear more. Um, but um, going forward, the declining admission volumes, um, uh, it's going to be difficult to sustain what we have. Um, it's going to be difficult to do it without the county's help. Um, in addition, there's a lot of outpatient services that we're evaluating. Um, the Providence deal is only the 24-hour emergency room. It doesn't deal with any of the other outpatient services. So we're working to figure out what services the community needs and what we can keep here. And that's, that's still ongoing. So I have been reviewing hospital financials for over 20 years, and it's, I still find it complicated. I understand it's real complicated. Um, when you appointed Antoinette, Ron, Yolanda to the board, they sat down with me for two different orientation sessions, over three hours each, um, to learn about this. And, and they said two things. They said they were exhausted, and they felt like they knew a lot more before. So um, it, it's very complicated, but anytime you have questions, you want to sit down and talk with me, I'm happy to do it. Um, Vice Chairman Goins, you already did sit down with me. I appreciate that. And um, I welcome any questions. Oh, Clara Medical. Has that been forgotten about, or is it going to be able to help the hospital? Um, I, I don't know that it's going to help the hospital, but it has not been forgotten about. What They have a spot right now that either their lease has run out or it's going to run out, and they don't feel comfortable with that location, and so they would like to move into the medical office building of the hospital. And we are still talking about that. Ms. Dosser, I want to thank you for being here. We all understand the importance of health care in Fairfield County and want to make sure that we all receive the best possible health care. I'm very concerned with health care in Fairfield County and just want to ask you a few questions, if that's okay. Sure. How many executive leaders are there at Fair FMH? There are four. Four. There's, there's myself. There's a... Um, CFO, whose primary responsibility are the financials of the hospital. There is a um, nursing executive, the chief nursing officer, and there is an operations executive who is responsible for all the services that aren't nursing. Would you say that FMH executive structure is standard for hospitals the size and profitability of FMH, even though you do not provide services like surgery, cardiology, or et cetera? Um, I don't know of any hospitals that don't have a CEO, a CFO, and a CNO. Um, and and um, sometimes the CEOs will, will take care of the departments that a COO will take care of. So, so it's similar or, or maybe three. You also have a outpatient clinic called Blue Granite. Does it make a profit? It does not. Has it ever made a profit? Um, not that I know of. Why is it still open? <laughs> well, that, that's, a, um, that's something I love to talk about, and I may keep you here for a long time if you get me started with that. Um, Blue Granite is a, um, is a primary care provider in this community. And this community is in a lot of need for additional primary care providers. There, there is not a single primary care provider that can stand alone as um, a provider's office. Um, you have um, the uh, Martin Center that gets assistance from USC, and you have Fa Fairfield Medical Associates, excuse me, that brings in other types of revenue opportunities like nuclear medicine to generate revenue. Um, when you're in a bigger hospital, there's always a discussion with the CEO and the hospital board on why they're losing so much money with providers. 
they, they make money in other ways. They make money by ordering lab tests, by ordering image tests, by, by, um, by providing a need to the community. Um, there, is, there is not a single excess provider in this community. This, this community needs a lot more than we have. How much money has the hospital had to write off or adjust due to errors on their part in the last year? How much, say that again? How much money has the hospital had to write off or adjust due to errors on their part in the last year? So due to errors on our part? Mm -hmm. um, I'll see if I can find that out for you. Okay. My last question, board and staff members are supposedly going to a conference in Hilton Head next month. And how do you think their attendance could actually help the hospital? Uh, well, I think it's kind of like this conversation right now. I don't, I don't know that there's any amount of education that is not um, beneficial, and uh, and it is their, it is they are they are volunteer board members. They they do not get paid a dime for all the time they spend doing this, and. It is their opportunity to interact with their peers, to network with their peers, and to um, to learn more about healthcare. It, it, is the hospital paying for their trip to Hilton Head? Yes. Well, I, I would tell you that if the hospital pays for their trip to Hilton Head and y'all come back to council asking for money, I will vote no. Because I think if, if they're going to go to Hilton Head, they should pay for it themselves, being in the financial condition that the hospital's in. That's all I got. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Ms. Dozer, how you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Um, would you happen to know the, I guess, the number of employees? Uh, I'm sorry, the number of employees that are that are hired by you, I guess, that works at the hospital full-time um, I, I do not if you asked me that a month ago I would tell you there are 142 but um, but we made some some cuts recently and so I don't know the exact number it's probably about 135 in, in no way shape or form of or am I trying to attack you but I just this is a small rural county we I kind of heard through the grapevine that the employees were told to take a pay cut is that true um, they were not told to take a pay cut. Nobody has taken a pay cut. But um, the staffing was not matching volumes. And so staffing was adjusted to volumes. Meaning that, I guess, certain departments were cut out, basically. Um, hours were cut. Were any of the, I guess, the execs pay cut? Um, no, no salaried employees were cut. What generates the most money over there? And that's my last question. Um, probably um, imaging services. Okay. Thank you for your time. Is there anyone else? Thank you so much. All right. Thanks. I just had one last item. I did want to comment on the solar eclipse event that we had. Um, Davidson College provided the county a grant and worked with the Fairfield um, Museum, and we put on a program uh, at the ball field on Garden Street, and they put on a program the night before, an educational program. We had about 100 people show up to that event. And at the event that we held at Garden Street, we had about 1,700 people show up. So it was a very successful event, and I just, again, want to thank uh, the Fairfield uh, Museum and Davidson College for putting that event on. At this time, the next item on the agenda is clerk to council's report. We have none. Second public comment session. Ms. Lothar. We have two speakers tonight. First, Mr. Jeff Schaefer, general thoughts. Mm. 
I'm dumbfounded, absolutely stupefied. I want to say congratulations to all of you. I am impressed. I usually come up here with a critical mouth and a critical thought and a comment that's not so pleasant most of the time, but I want to tell you that tonight I'm, boy, you did a great job. Thank you very much. Not only did you listen to me and Randy's questions and whatever question came up, you had your own questions. Um, it makes me proud to hear you speak up and ask questions that sometimes aren't pleasant to the people in the audience or people coming trying to tell you what they've done, the library, whoever it is. Um, but that's what we need to do. We need to have that kind of communication going on so that we can hear where are the fire hydrants? What's going on with the hospital? We need those kind of questions that are hard based because they give us the answers you want to hear and we want to hear. Um, and then things get done. Matter of factly, they get done. Um, so I want to thank you very, very much for doing that um, and listening. You know, it's hard enough to sit here and talk all night long, but to listen, try to come up with a response and an answer uh, and, and come to solve a problem. I have not seen that happen. I'll say this to you honestly. I wish Billy was here because I know he's part of that, but um, I have not seen that happen in years coming to these meetings. So maybe I've been blind and stupid, possible, but I want to tell you, thank you all. Thank you. Next, Mr. Randy Bright speaking on Priority One. Randy Bright, District 1, Ridgeway. I'd like to echo Jeff's sentiments. Uh, I really appreciate the engagement from the from the uh, council engagement as far as that's going to improve all of our lives as Jess said and I won't go on and on but thank you so much for being engaged and and asking the tough questions and, and looking into things tonight I, I also want to talk on um, priorities this um, SCANA slash V uh, FFC combined fiasco for our county may have a silver lining and that silver lining may be that we continue the focus and become razor focused on some of the priorities that we have facing us in the county. But I think we got, perhaps your predecessors got a little lazy because of the pot of the gold at the end of the VC summer rainbow. And uh, we talk about priorities. Now we have to focus on our priorities. We can't just shotgun our money around the county. Now we have to run a more efficient county government without lessening services, but by ensuring that we have enough money to invest in the priority one, which is jobs and the economy. That makes everything work. Good jobs, good economy, which we don't have right now, but we can have by being focused. And going back to running an efficient county, if you recall a couple years ago, we did our own study where we found out we spend twice as much as any rural, or as the average rural county per capita. We, we have far more full-time employees, yet, well, you can judge how much better we are than the counties. Are we twice as good as our fellow rural counties? we got great people, but I don't know if we're twice as good. So focusing on being, running a more efficient county, comparing ourselves to other counties without sacrificing services goes a long way to ensure that we have enough money to make a land purchase that might lead to thousands or even hundreds of jobs, which we desperately need. We just lost 500 jobs at VC Summer and all the economy that went with it. We're going to lose another 200 and some jobs uh, from fiber, uh, the fiber manufacturer, and that's, we only have like 9,000 employees uh, employed in the county, period. So economy and jobs got to be priority one. In order to get it, we've got to run an efficient and effective government to ensure that we have enough money to invest in our future's economy and our future jobs. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes segment two. Thank you, Ms. Harper. This time, I'd like to hear a motion to go into executive session. Oh, excuse me. I skipped over there. Excuse me. Got a council time. Is there anyone? I'd like to have, say a little something. Uh, we had uh, Ms. Goings, uh, Doug Pauley, Neil Robinson, and myself with uh, Senator 
fanning and our administrator and deputy administrator an opening for the Midford Recreation Center. Uh, it was packed. It's, this makes me think that maybe uh, this thing might work out after all. Madam Chair, I just want to commend you on a job well done tonight. I know you probably had a little nervous, and you, but you did very well. And I want I wanted to commend you on a job very well done as chair in the meeting tonight. And also, I wanted to say that uh, I know Tony Hill talked about the new radios, and I've heard uh, some people, volunteer firemen, commenting on how well the radios work. And I think they were the low bid, and they seem to be. be performing very well so I think did a very good job on those and uh, the only other thing is I will be, I will miss the next meeting September 11th I'm going to be in California visiting my sister so uh, I won't be here at the next one but thank you everybody for being here tonight too Madam Chair I just wanted to give administration and the recreation department praises for the back to school event that was hosted in Drawley Park I, I think it was great getting the community together and if possible, maybe we can look at having something twice a year versus once. From speaking with a lot of patrons that were out there, they like the fact that the county came forward to try to get the community together versus just asking for uh, participation from citizens with the recreation. So I think there's something we're on to a good thing, and I'd like to see more of it. Madam Chair, I, I think the recreation uh, participating with the back to school thing was great. The only thing I can see that we, we need to improve taking it to other areas, uh, the western side of the county, the eastern side of the county. All the kids that stay in the outskirts of the county do not have transportation to get up to Winsboro. So I think it would be very much advantageous if we spread it out a little bit. So much, and uh, and I definitely agree with that. As, as um, Councilman Robinson was saying, when he was saying that about twice a year, it's possible that we can spread something out into different areas. That would be a great thing. I want to also say um, thank you to administrators and everybody, and to um, Councilman Douglas for the event and opening the new recreation center in our county. That was just One great. They, there you go. They did. They did a marvelous job. And I am thankful. Um, just looking at the center, it is great. We're going to enjoy it. I'm looking forward to the one opening, West Side Recreation Center opening on the 17th of next month. And we're excited about that and want to invite each and every one of you, bring your friends, bring your cousins and everybody. And we're going to try to make it just a good evening of the, with the community. So thank you so much. I want to always thank our administrators and um, Deputy Administrator for the work that they do and clerk to council. Is there anyone else? At this time, we'd like to re receive a motion to go into executive session. So moved. All right, it's been moved in property second. Ex uh, excuse me. The following statement, <coughs> the following statement is provided in compliance with the South Carolina Freedom of Information Act. Subsequent to executive session, council may take action on matters discussed in executive session. Matters to be discussed tonight is receipt of legal advice, review of potential litigation and other legal options regarding Scanner's planned abandonment of, provide, of the proposed VC Summers nuclear units in Jenkinsville. It has been second. It has been motion moved and probably second that we enter into executive session. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, or hear none. The motion is carried, six to zero. We are now in executive session. We do have one finance meeting, too, before the executive session. After. after.